carried into glory to such a degree that right after, you know, what they were saying in Rome, right? Santo subito, now. The man is with God. That man is holy, right? But there's a cause. It has to take a process. But even that has gone through, like, you know, mock speed. And so here we are in 2011 on this day, Divine Mercy Sunday, even in death, he's an apostle of mercy, right? He's being beatified on Divine Mercy Sunday. It's unbelievable. It's like, John Paul II, how much more can you do, right? Probably when he's canonized, it'll be on Divine Mercy Sunday, you know, and there'll be some, the Pope at that point will write an encyclical or something, you know, it's unbelievable what this guy has done. But see, it's unbelievable what God has done. Because the Divine Mercy message, it's, it's not about being Polish. Yeah, I meet a lot of people in different cultures and they think, eh, the Divine Mercy, the image, it's red and white, looks a little too Lithuanian or Polish to me, so us Lithuanians, we're not, we don't like that, right? No, that's silliness, that's so silly. Get beyond that stuff. This is such a blessing to the world. And that's why right now it is one of the fastest grassroots movements among the laity in the church, globally, it's everywhere. People are getting that image of divine mercy, and people are learning to trust in Jesus Christ. Just like the great apostle, St. Faustina, and John Paul II sought to do, to trust. As a matter of fact, did you know also, a lot of people don't know this, did you know that um, St. Faustina's spiritual director, Father Michael Sapochko, was also beatified? Blessed Michael Sapochko right? The one that you read about in her diary, the one who actually told her to start writing the diary, right? We live in, Poland has been cranking out some saints lately, right? You know, <laughs> unbelievable. God is so in love with us that he's given this message for our times. And, and why, and I want to focus on one particular thing, because this is the spirituality that John Paul II lived through, big time, and his example of being a priest, and primarily of being a priest. I mean, that man was a priest. He, he taught a whole new generation of men in the seminaries how to be a priest. We look to him as a model of a priest with unwavering in the truth and yet full of compassion and love and mercy, acting really as a spiritual father and being willing to love the children to such a degree that he won't let them play with fire, that he'll have the courage and the fatherhood to correct his children when they're going down a bad path. That was John Paul II. And the one central message to this message of mercy, what is it? It's trust. You know, at the bottom of that image, when Jesus said to St. Faustina, I desire for you to have an image painted according to the pattern that you see with the inscription written at the bottom, Jesus, I trust in you. That is significant. That is hugely significant. Why? Because he could have said tons of other things. He could have said, right at the bottom, Jesus, I love you. Amen to that, right? We, we do, Lord, we love you. But that's not what he wanted put there. He could have said, Jesus, we praise you. Glory to Jesus, or whatever, it, anything. But he didn't. He wanted at the bottom of that image, Jesus, I trust in you. Because... In our times, there's a lot of not trusting in Jesus. There's a lot of people in the world today that don't want to trust him. They think that he's up in the heavens rolling dice with their life and with the church. Eh, mm, try it again. And they think that God's just playing games. And they think that he's not trustworthy, that he's actually, that he's a manipulator and a liar and a deceiver. And you'll have people saying that about God and about his church. Why would you stay in this church, this outdated, antiquated, you know, church? Move on. Why? Look at what some of these priests have done. Why would you hang around? But see, that's not to think as God thinks. That's to think as men think. Imagine if, if, if Peter and, and John and James had said to Jesus at the beginning of the church, you know, Jesus, we dig you, man. You're cool. But this Judas guy... Dude is a loser. So because of that, I'm afraid we're going to have to bail. So we kind of like your message, and we'll, 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 we'll kind of run with that, but I'm afraid we're going to have to not kind of hang out with you anymore. 
No, they didn't do that. As a matter of fact, they did the opposite. Because Jesus asked them, are you too going to leave? And Peter steps up like he always did, sometimes sticking his foot in his mouth. But he said, Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And we know this. You are the Son of God. And that's what we have to be saying today to him. Jesus, I trust you. The world is messed up. And in many instances, you know, there's tons of issues going on in the church right now. You know this. Tons of issues. You've got people fighting each other. You've got this person saying this and this person saying this. And it's, sometimes it's like, wait, what the heck is going on? But you've got to remember one fundamental principle. Jesus founded this church, and it's going to be here till the end because the gates of hell cannot prevail against it, even though the members inside of it are messed up. I'm messed up. You're messed up. That's not the point. The point is this is how he wants it to be done on his terms, not on our terms. And the sooner we trust him, the better. Really. And what is trust, really? It's faith in action, right? In a lot of the romantic languages, the word trust, is it comes along with the word like confidence, confide, like with faith, right? In English, it, it, we just say trust. But it's, it's like fi taking faith, it's taking knowledge of something to another level and living it in good times and in bad, in health and in sickness. It's a marriage. I trust you, and I'm going to be with you to the end. I know that you're not out to deceive me, lie to me, and manipulate to me because you're God. You're out for my ultimate good, even though I have to go through difficult times financially, right? There's a lot of people in the world today, false prophets, preaching the gospel of money. You've got to have money, and unless you, if you don't have money, you're not one of God's blessed ones. That's false. That is so false, it's not even funny. But there's tons of people preaching it. But see, it's funny that even on, well, at least American money, it says, in God we trust. Sadly, a lot of people are trying to get that taken off of our currency in America because we're a culture that's trying not to trust. We'll do it our way. We don't need you anymore. We've been educated. We can do it our own way, thanks, but no thanks. That's what so many societies and cultures are saying right now in their government policies and the way that they're educating people. It's a tragedy. And the heart of Jesus is like bleeding for us to trust him, to have confidence in him. As I was going through this in seminary, because I knew that the Lord wanted me to just spread this message of mercy and to help people to trust in Jesus, I was reading through the scriptures and I was like, boy, this is very interesting because even demons acknowledge who Jesus is, right? Having knowledge is not good enough, right? When Jesus comes on the scene, you know, 2,000 years ago and he's walking this earth, demons cry out, we know who you are. You're the son of God. They know who he is. They acknowledge his presence. But do they trust him? Right? Jesus himself says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. Trust is required. Jesus says in the message of, to St. Faustina in the diary that it is as it were, God's hands are tied. And that seems crazy. He's God. How could his hands be tied, right? But just speaking in that language, how could God not do something? Well, he's, he's almost held like inoperable, inactive, when we don't trust him. It's like he can't give us the blessings that he wants for us if we don't trust him. And he says to St. Faustina in the diary, the one vessel through which souls are to come to me and reap all the blessings, all the ocean of mercy, there's one vessel, trust. You've got to trust me. See, if we don't trust Jesus, we're going to start looking at the church that he founded like it's only a human institution. And we're going to think it does need to update with the times. It does need to change its doctrine in matters of morality. And you'll come up with crazy ideas on a steering committee and in small group to think that, well, people are leaving, so let's get them back by making it more inclusive and diversified and tolerant of everything. 
Mm, that's not the way God thinks. That's the way men think. When we learn to trust in Jesus, we take him at his word, as hard as it may be, and as deep as that hook you never catch a fish with a dull hook. As deep as that hook gets into your soul, it'll hurt. That's okay. God's a fisherman. He's got lots of line. And you can run under the boat way out to sea. But he'll just let you go. You can run, but you can't get away. And when you exhaust yourself, he'll flip over the lever and reel you in. Truth is what will save the world. Truth is what sets us free, and we've got to trust it, right? Think about this. 